chances are, if you have an RTX card, you have a pretty banging setup. But what happens if you don't? What happens if, hypothetically of course, you only have a dual core CPU from 2012 in your main computer, but you want your life to be an RTX? Well, for all of you hypotheticals out there, today is your lucky day. I'm also aware that I did not use hypotheticals correctly in that statement. In my previous video, I visited the $99 CPU that changed my life. It's a Celeron G550, a dual core 2.6 gigahertz Sandy Bridge CPU from 2012. It doesn't have that much going for it. In that video, I pushed it pretty far, way beyond what I would expect in 2012. But in this video, I wanna push it even further and try something that I've actually never tried on the channel before. That's ray tracing. Ray tracing has its ups and downs, of course, and it's a pretty new technology for consumer desktops, all things considered. But I wanna try it on some not so stellar hardware and kick off some ray tracing experiments on this channel. Zotac sent over an RTX 2080 Super for us to do some testing. And what's a better Ostox experiment than some bottlenecking action? Oh, and I wanna say thank you, Zotac, for sending this over and being very flexible with me while I was making this video. You guys rock. So today I present you RTX on a $99 CPU. Let's do it. So it turns out that ray tracing has actually been here for a while. Movie studios use ray tracing and patch tracing techniques to create realistic animation renders. The issue is converting that into real time gaming. There have been techniques and mods for this before RTX was coined by Nvidia, but they definitely helped push the ray and path tracing agenda to the masses. This of course means that you actually don't need an RTX card to try ray or path tracing, which I will visit in another video, but for now, let's stick to just the RTX lineup. The biggest problem with using this real-time lighting technique is that it consumes a lot of resources, definitely more on the GPU side than the CPU side, but the CPU is still very important here. If you look at all of the AAA RTX games, they require pretty high-end processors. Battlefield 5, Ryzen 7 1700, or an i7 8700. Control, an i5 7600K, or a Ryzen 5 1600X. Metro Exodus, 4770K recommended, and if you want to play on high settings, an 8700K. Call of Duty Modern Warfare, the one that released in 2019, an i5 2500K, or a Ryzen 5 1600X, which, by the way, is a very weird combination because the 1600X is undoubtedly faster than the 2500K. So that's a little bit of a weird recommendation, but the point is all of these CPUs are pretty powerful. So when I say that this $99 CPU is not the best contender, believe me. But to keep things a little bit more scientific and to show you guys what you could get, I'll have another test system available so you guys can see performance without such a major bottleneck. Something worth mentioning is the bandwidth limitation of this processor. So my motherboard is the H77 ITX AE, I believe, from Zotac, and it supports PCIe 3.0 by 16. Unfortunately, the Celeron does not. It only supports PCIe 2.0. This means that we're only gonna get at maximum 80% of the available bandwidth on the RTX 2080 Super, roughly. Honestly, I'd be surprised if the Celeron could squeeze out more than 50% of the 2080 Super's performance, but I guess we'll find out soon. The games we'll try are Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Control, the Quake RTX demo, and the Minecraft Beta RTX demo NVIDIA just released. So let's get started. I dove head first into RTX gaming and I started with Call of Duty Modern Warfare, the 2019 edition. The loading screen was pretty telling of the experience I was going to have. I was there waiting for about five minutes the first time I loaded up the game. Someone please save me from this misery. Load faster. While I could still technically play the game, it was choppy and riddled with drop frames. Sometimes 
a drop frame would last a few seconds. Turning off RTX did improve performance a little bit, but it went from abysmal to slightly less abysmal. The poor processor was pegged at 100% the entire time and changing the resolution and the settings did not fix this. On the other hand, the 2080 Super was at 30% for most of the run. Now, I understand that this is not very scientific, but if we look at tech power up, about 30% of a 2080 is going to give us GTX 1050 Ti to GTX 1650 performance. The G550, it's way out of its league. The Ryzen 5 system held its own very well in Call of Duty. I averaged over 100 FPS with RTX on and RTX off with the same settings. But to be honest, I didn't see a worthy visual difference between the two. I had to definitely look for something different. It didn't come naturally. The biggest place was definitely the shadows. Objects and NPCs have a clear difference in their shadows with RTX on versus RTX off. I tried to look for a difference in reflections, but couldn't find anything worthwhile. And that's because COD doesn't support real-time reflections, so it makes sense. At least the shadows look good, though. Quake obviously had a huge difference in every aspect. The lights bounced, they refracted and defracted properly, and shadows were a lot more realistic. And honestly, I think that's where ray tracing really shines. It can bring life to old games. The G550 performed well with RTX on and RTX off, which I expect since Quake 2 is over two decades old, but RTX does give a hefty performance hit. I know this is a demo and there's still kinks in the system, but for a fast paced game like Quake, the performance difference really does matter. The G550 and 2080 Super combo still pass with all things considered. Also, look at those usage stats. Honestly, the Celeron can actually breathe here so much that even a 2080 Super is being put to work. It's over 30%, which is totally different from Modern Warfare. That's both terrifying and a little bit unstressful at the same time. I was very excited to test control on my $99 CPU. Alas, my Celeron was too slow to even make it to the main menu of the game. I spent maybe 20 minutes waiting for the splash screen to finish loading before I called it quits. Maybe next time. And lastly, this game would not be complete if I did not test one of the most popular games and I think one of the best selling games ever, Minecraft. Nvidia released the Minecraft RTX beta recently and I had the opportunity to test it out. Let me just say, it was a great time. And on the fifth day, the Lord said, let there be RTX. <laughs> also, follow me on Twitch oh for God. more exclusive content. Twitch.tv slash OztalksHW. The difference between RTX on and off is honestly shocking. I understand that Sue shaders and mods have done this for a while now, but it's always good to see large corporations acknowledging modifications and helping push the agenda. Realistic lighting and reflections really breathe a new life into the game. Just look here. In the lobby of the color, light, and shadow RTX showcase map with RTX off, it looks pretty standard. No reflections, static shadow maps, and bland color, and little light interaction. Once we turn on RTX, it adds realism to a very unrealistic looking game. Oh, and the best parts? No oily floor. <clears throat> For the most part, performance was fine, but it does have a wide range depending on your map and your settings. I used the lowest render settings for everything, set anti-aliasing to 1, and kept graphics at fancy. In the global illumination zone, the $1 CPU sat around 82 FPS without RTX and ran fairly smoothly. With RTX on, the game sat around 55 FPS, dipping to the 40s with reflections on screen, but it still performed great. Neon City, on the other hand, didn't run well once we stepped outside. It was playable without RTX, but once RTX was turned on, the poor Celeron struggled to keep its head above water. This was the case with the Ryzen 5 build as well, but the difference here is the usage. Take a look. The $1 Celeron is pegged at 100% the entire time with the 2080 Super not really breaking a sweat. It's quite the opposite with the Ryzen 5 system. It's barely breathing while the 2080 Super is pushed to its absolute limit. Naturally, Nvidia does have a workaround for this called DLSS. I'll link a video on DLSS below, but it's a deep learning algorithm that keeps frame rates high without sacrificing quality in Minecraft anyway. Sadly, enabling it doesn't help one bit with the Celeron because the bottleneck is simply too great. I tried different areas of Minecraft, including the Imagination Island, and the color, light, and shadow showcase, and Neon City. There wasn't a difference because the GPU was held back by the $1 CPU. 
Enabling DLSS with the R5 3600 machine helped immensely without a noticeable image quality degree. In the On City, performance skyrocketed from 45 FPS to 70 FPS, a 55% increase. Imagination Island didn't have such a drastic change, but it was still big enough for it to be welcome and noticeable. It also seemed that the settings played a big part. If I maxed out render distance, it didn't matter if DLSS was on or off, performance remained low. Regardless, if you want to try out Minecraft RTX with a system that meets the recommended requirements, then you'll totally be fine. If for some reason you have a dual core CPU from 2011, then you can get by in some of the worlds and maybe once the beta is updated to the official release, performance will get better, but don't count on doing too much. When it's all said and done, the $99 CPU is technically capable of playing games with ray tracing, both with RTX and with path tracing modifications if you just follow a simple algorithm. If game is from 2012 or earlier, play. Else, stay away. It rhymes, so that's how you know that it actually works. But honestly, even without ray tracing, it's incapable of playing modern games, which is totally expected. When it comes to older games though, it does ray tracing fine. Just look at Minecraft and Quake 2. So to answer a few questions that I've kind of had on my mind while I did this experiment, is ray tracing possible on a budget? I can definitely see it being possible if the game isn't too hard to run and if your settings are correct. I'll have to do a little bit more realistic testing in the future, but with new software like Radeon Image Sharpening and DLSS, I can definitely see it being a possibility. The second question is, does ray tracing have a place in the gaming world. I definitely think it does. I believe ray tracing is here to stay, but clearly some games would make more sense with ray tracing than others. RPGs, big story world building games, not fast paced shooters. Personally, I think ray tracing in RTX would make an amazing implementation with older games that are going to be remastered. Like Halo Combat Evolved just got released on Steam and I think if you can add some kind of path tracing modification to that, it would look phenomenal. And lastly, what's next for the $99 CPU? Honestly, I don't know. This, <laughs> whew, this CPU has tested my patience. It's kind of crazy to me that I was able to use this processor back in 2012 in my main computer, but times change, priorities change, expectations change, and technology changes. I wouldn't force my worst enemies to use this processor. Except for eBay scammers that post GTX cards that aren't really GTX cards. I would totally send this to them. Maybe I'll make a video on that. But that's it for this video, guys. If you liked it, then leave a like. If you loved it, share, subscribe, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, give Zotac some love for being very flexible with this entire video. And for sending me a 2080 Super absolutely insane. I really appreciate it. Hopefully this will give you guys a little bit more insight on the budget world and ray tracing and how those two intersect because I do believe that there can be a happy marriage between the two. With that being said, make sure you follow me on Twitter, Instagram at Oztalks Hardware or Oztalks HW on both and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.